It's over 40 years since Neil Young wrote the lyrics, Mother Nature on the Run in the 20th century. It's over 40 years since we first became aware of climate change. And in that time, we haven't done so well. Now, I've been involved with new technologies that are uh, being invented to try to preserve the atmosphere. And what I've found is that is a lot of problems when we try to replicate what uh, f fossils already have. So let's begin with photosynthesis. We all know photosynthesis from school. It takes sunlight, solar energy, turns it into uh, stored energy carbohydrates. And those carbohydrates feed every single thing on Earth. Well, nearly everything. There's still those pre-photosynthesis babies in deep Earth's trenches that don't eat carbs. Not only does that, it produces O2. And it's a very reactive, very reactive uh, molecule. In the early days of, the, of, of photosynthesis, there was a different atmosphere. It starts creating an atmosphere that is uh, rich in O2. And whatever comes into contact with O2 that, that reacts with it, oxidizes, and turns into something that's deposited, built up, and stored. And from that period, all ores are, are, are laid down. That's where we get our iron ore, and that's where we get our other ores. Photosynthesis creates an environment where everything can grow, and it, it builds into uh, an atmosphere much more like we know today. That atmosphere vacillates. Some hundred million years it's warm, some hundred million years it's cold, but it uh, really doesn't vary that much. Life goes on. It gets pummeled by meteors. It gets, um, it gets uh, polluted by volcanoes. Some life goes extinct, but the process goes on, and that's very much the atmosphere that we know uh, in the world today. In addition to that, it lays down all of the limestone, because limestone comes from um, life that feeds off of those carbohydrates, and it conveniently lays that everywhere on the seabeds that rises out of the seabeds and with the plate tectonics, and it's, it's universally distributed throughout Earth. But there's something really interesting about photosynthesis that I've just come across recently. There's been a plethora of, of recent published research that um, is following a discovery that photosynthesis actually prolongs uh, quantum coherence. Now, we don't have to understand quantum mechanics to understand that. What is really important is that quantum coherence doesn't normally exist on Earth for very long periods of time. In fact, it, 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 is, it, it doesn't exist for more than a femtosecond, which is our shortest period, for shortest measure of time, a quadrillionth of a second. We're talking about really small here. And it changes. We don't really need to know what it does, but just to give you an idea, they talk about how it has a purity of light, and then it goes through certain circumstances, and then it gets mixed. For some reason or other, photosynthesis is able to prolong that by 300 times, which is a very big factor. And in doing so, it, it uses that in its, its process. And I think the most important thing, though, is that um, life itself has created that. When we start working with fossil alternatives, it's, um, it, it's something that we're competing with. And I think that at the source of why we've had so much difficulty in trying to get alternatives, whether it be our fuel alternatives or, like I work with, um, uh, material alternatives, it's a very difficult prospect. As I said, we've known about the problem for 40 years. It's been 10 years since Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth, and our track record is really poor. Um, and it, there's another side to it, because with our use of fossils, we've also built a, an entire infrastructure around ourselves. Not only do we use it all the time in, in everything we do, but within a matter of a very short period of time, we've constructed an entire um, uh, infrastructure of uh, power plants, of refineries, of roads, of uh, airports, of uh, the houses we live in, 
at any buildings, and that, that actually is the biggest user of, of, uh, of, of fossil sources of, of any single user, it's, it's our heating and cooling. So we've built this entire infrastructure that, um, that we're completely and inextricably linked to. To replace that is a, is a big problem. The industries that are, are delivering that, fuel industries, are a $4 trillion a year industry. So it's, it's a major part of our, our economy. And so, so breaking those trends is really hard. When I've tried to develop alternatives, that always presents a problem. But in, in any new technology, you run into problems. Uh, but for some reason or other, when we got involved with trying to develop a negative CO2 cement, which I, I did it uh, with Imperial, um, it just became even that much more difficult. And I have a feeling that it's the same if we, I, I, you know, I truly don't believe that we can develop a synthetic fuel that could compete with, with what photosynthesis has, has delivered to us. I was just talking to Rosalind Cornforth downstairs, and if you think about it, our goal um, what, 40 years ago when we first began to realize there's climate change was to arrest climate ch change. Um, and in all the recent legislation, all the recent efforts by governments, it's to uh, increase, uh, stop the increase at 2%. Rosalind tells me that really the thinking is it's 4%. If we burn up all the fossil fuels, we burn up six, we go up 6%, and we're on track for that. Even developing countries are, are starting to come into the picture of, of, of the impact, and it keeps growing and keeps growing. So the likelihood that we can arrest that trend is, is really, really hard. It's, it's, um, I, I think you know, we have to be really frank with ourselves and, and, and look at um, the reality of the matter and, um, and address the issue that we are stuck with the fossil. And, until, and, and we have very little chance to make a, a change from that fossil. So one of the things I also came across, which is also something that has to do with evolution, um, is if you look at Darwin, da Darwin um, writes a lot about um, uh, adaptive systems and um, survival of the fittest and the like, but he also writes extensively about something called pre-adaptation. It's also something that Stephen Jay Gould called exaptation, and I really love that word because it fits what I, 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 I think is a useful approach to things. Um, so the pre-adaptation is, if you, um, if you look at an embryo in a fish or an embryo in a mammal, they're very much the same. You can't really quite tell the difference at embryo stage. And on those embryos, there's, there's marks. And in the fish, those marks become gills. In mammals, they become ears. Okay, an example of pre-adaptation. Actually, if you start looking, there's endless examples of pre-adaptation. The skin flaps on, on um, a, a squirrel become a flying squirrel. Or, um, or a, one that's really interesting, a, a, a dog licks your face. Well, the wolf had to lick the, the, the alpha male's face to get its food, to regurgitate the food. And that's a process that just it transfers through. I think the really interesting ones are, are ones that are, um, they, they occur in one uh, species or one creature, and then suddenly, overnight, they, they are, have use in another. And I think the attraction of, of that in understanding technology is, is um, important and where we have to go. Um, because on, if, we, if we actually look at replacement of fossil fuels or if we look at material replacements, it's very difficult. Now, I want to tell a story about cement because that's what I was involved with. I know it's not that interesting, but um, I, 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 bear with me. Cement is the most manufactured uh, material on Earth. Cement is, comes from a fossil. Cement is, a concrete is the most uh, a consumed substance after water. There are three tons of cement for, for everyone on Earth. Where are your three tons? For every ton of cement that's manufactured, a ton of CO2 is released. You know, we always hear CO2, CO2. What is CO2? Well, what is CO2 if it's just a 
a, a solid body of, of, of uh, a, a solid body of uh, pure gas, it would take up, actually, probably about the size of this building. It's about that size. But w what is it in our atmosphere? It's actually a trace gas. So in, in our atmosphere, if we took a cubic meter at sea level and we um, looked at what's in there, it's, it's three billion um, trillion molecules. And if you took three times that, say the size of a, 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 a big boardroom table, um, that's three times three billion trillion. That's all the stars in the visible universe, in, including what we see from the Hubble. Now, the importance of that is that that material is, is just a trace gas, but it's so fine it's, and so uh, uh, pervasive through that, our atmosphere, that, and it has such a good uh, reflective and high reflective surface area that um, it's an it's a extremely delicate balance. So when we burn those tons of fossil sources to make one ton of cement, um, we're, we're producing um, loads and loads of those, those molecules, and that then expands in, in a vast way. Um, and that's, I think, another reason why it's really difficult with a lot of these technologies. We also look at things like carbon capture and sequestration, and um, we look at um, uh, trying to, to, to manipulate the, uh, the power plants and, and, and make something of it, which I think are just really noble things, but I think we're also fighting a, 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 an upward battle. On the other hand, that's where I see exaptation coming in. And, and maybe for the power plants, it's, the idea there is that we have loads of technologies that work and currently work. I mean, one of the examples is another business I was involved with, which is a void former for concrete. Okay, another boring thing. But the void former takes out um, non-working dead load in that concrete. It actually improves the performance of the thing because it's taking out something that's not needed. It's just dead load that's weighing it down. That's interesting because it takes out a third of the concrete we're using. Now, we put that together with uh, tubes, kind of like underfloor heating tubes, but they're designed for, for concrete structure. And we then used fluid to manage the latent energy in the building. We did this with the architect Sana in, at Essen University. We built a building. That building has um, zero consumption, energy consumption. It's, it's energy neutral. And it's, it's, it's totally feasible to build energy neutral s solutions. And it's totally feasible to do it with technologies that we know today. Another reason why it's really important to use technologies we already know, especially in the built environment, is the, the hurdles to get a, a, a material approved for use in a, in a house or in, a, in any building um, has to prove that it's, um, it's entirely safe and, and it therefore has to be insurable. It has to be recognizable, and the knowledge of use has to be there. Um, it has to have uh, um, a, um, a. It has to be readily available, and believe me, it has to be cheap. Heating and cooling is one of the biggest uh, contributors to, to to the use of, of greenhouse uh, to fossil fuels. In uh, Doha, for the demonstration sa stadium for the for the World Cup, Arabs developed something that I think is so interesting because it does a lot of things that we should be looking at. It takes the sunlight, concentrates it, heats up, um, uh, he heats up a fluid, and does something that we've been doing for longer than the electric light bulb, which is making ice. Um, that's been around for a long time. All you have to do is heat up one side, and it, it refrigerates the other side. So ice, ice plants have always used that technology. So we have two technologies that are known, put them together, and we make ice in the desert. Um, absolutely an interesting way of looking at things. If you, and if you applied that universally, suddenly you're, you're, you're making extreme inroads into one of the biggest consumers of, of fuels. Um, and then there's other, there's other technologies. There's, there's in, in Singapore, there's, um, there's a building that's been built that has an interstitial space that's a greenhouse. Very interesting. We're starting to use nature itself, photosynthesis itself. And guess what? Photosynthesis is interesting. It's a little refrigerator. It's an endothermic process. It actually cools. It's not just shading the building. 
um, it's, and giving whatever you need and, and absorbing CO2 and doing all the stuff it does, it's also acting as a refriger refrigerant. Um, in um, Rotterdam, there's a, um, a, 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 an experimental stage carbon capture and sequester technology where they're actually taking CO2 from power plants and putting it into the glass houses, the many glass houses that you have in the Netherlands. Um, that's a process that we've always done, which is we actually take manufactured CO2 and inject it into to, to growing spaces to enhance the growth. Well, if we can get it from somewhere and put it in, that's the next thing. So really, what I think um, is important to me is that th those technologies like a negative CO2 cement or even the void form, it, 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 so many of these technologies are so exciting, but when you come up against it, if you're trying to replace the fossil, we have to think again. Um, here's a, if, you, if you think of it this way, there's a comparison. We've got, um, a, there's a sort of a maxim in the, the, um, in the development of digital technology that every 18 months, the speed doubles and the device go, turns in half. Okay, we're going through a process of exponential development in that industry. If you think about it, the Earth went through that exponential development hundreds of millions of years ago when suddenly photosynthesis evolves. It's had the time, but not only that, it's doing something that we don't do. In, in digital technology, all we're doing is binary and, um, and algorithms. It's you know, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus. It's using quantum. Now, quantum when they look at that stuff, they don't even use a language that we know. They have to actually use a, a, a language that they, they, they describe it through means that we understand because it doesn't behave the way we do. It's hardly binary. And somehow, photosynthesis has been able to, to manipulate that. And so I think that, I, I think that we have to respect that in, in terms of what we're looking at, because if we don't, if we think we're going to be able to do it, and I don't, I'm not saying that we shouldn't do the programs, I think it would be beautiful to find a, a panacea invention. But I think if we only concentrate on the panacea inventions, then we're going to end up with, um, with, with nothing. We have to instead look at the things we've got and move into the, to the next um, uh, uh, position uh, with things that we have, and we can make very rapid progress. Thank you very much.